Welcome everyone to the Pentecostals of Bossier City Church Online. Thank you so much for joining us for our 10 a.m. service. I am Levi Golden. I am the student pastor here at this amazing church. And today is very special because we have our students leading us in worship. So let's get ready to worship with them. Just a quick reminder, if you are a guest joining us this Sunday morning, thank you so much for joining us. It truly is an honor to have you with us this morning. If you would, follow the link below and take just a couple seconds to fill out that online connect card. This way our team can get in contact with you and your family. Another reminder, we do have a 6 p.m. service tonight and we have a very special guest speaker joining us. Brother Matt Tuttle is going to be bringing the word. You do not want to miss that. Again, thank you so much for joining us on this service. We know that God is doing some incredible things here through this live stream. So we'd love to see you join us again tonight and week on week. Again, thank you so much for joining us. And we believe God is going to do something great in this season. We love you and we look forward to an amazing Sunday here at the Pentecostals of Bossier City.
like to say thank you to our current worship team for the beautiful job that they did for us. And I want to say welcome to whoever you are, wherever you may be watching this from, whenever you may be watching this. I, I assume that somebody's probably watching this months or even years after the fact. And right now, we're in an uncertain season. However, it's only uncertain from the perspective of man. Right now we are walking in the ordained will of God and you can feel his presence in this place right now. We know that he is here and we expect great things in this season. If you're watching right now with us in this current day, I expect a praise to rise out of your hearts before we continue in this service. Wherever you are, if you're at your house right now, would you clap your hands and love God for a moment? say, Father, I glorify you in the trial. I glorify you in this moment of uncertainty, in this moment of doubt. Father, you still reign upon your throne and you still reign for eternity. We glorify the precious name of Jesus Christ. And if you're at home, you can still say it out loud with me. Amen. Thank you, worship team. I'm going to start from 1 Samuel chapter 5. 1 Samuel chapter 5, and I know some of you probably are at home, and you might be going to your Bible there, so I would say go ahead, take a few moments, flip to those pages, I will take a small drink of water while you do that. I'm going to pick up during a somewhat uncertain time for the people of Israel. In 1 Samuel 5 and 2, we pick up the story where the Philistines have actually captured the Ark of the Covenant. And they brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when the Ashdodites arose early in the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him in his place again. But when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the Ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This thoughtless, powerless, man-made, crafted God was humbled whether he liked it or not before the ark of God. I'm going to speak for a few moments on this subject. Here is my God. Here is my God. People for as long as people have been around have left to their own devices, created their own gods. For millennia this has been a tradition. It's something that even the people, the Hebrew people did whenever Moses disappeared to talk for God for an extended period of time. They decided that they had to craft their own God and out came the golden calf. And that story is well known to anybody who even has gone through Sunday school as a child, you know this story, but the Old Testament records many gods, many gods, but not just Dagon, not just this golden calf, but Dagon of the Philistines, Baal of the Canaanites, Milcom of the Ammonites, Ashtoreth, Chemosh, Marduk. There are so many gods that you read about in the Scripture, so many gods that are in the Scripture, even though we don't hear their names read aloud in those verses. There were so many gods within these different pagan cultures. By the time that you get to the Greeks... They had at least 300, 350 gods, maybe closer to 650 gods, depending on how you like to count gods, what you count as a god. But by the time of the Romans, they were far more conservative. They only had 67 gods to count. But within all these cultures, their gods often had these grotesque, sometimes wicked and perverse backstories. And if you read the stories of how some of these gods came to be, some of them actually kind of make you creeped out even this present day. I know that this is something of the past, but these backstories that they crafted for these gods will actually send a chill up your spine. But during this age, during this time when many gods existed across the many nations of the earth, God spoke to his people and said in Joshua 23 and 6, be very firm then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses so that you may not turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left so that you will not associate with these nations, these which remain among you, or mention the name of their gods, or make anyone swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. But you are to cling to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. He made it clear to them, you do not swear 
to their gods. You do not serve their gods. You don't bow down to their gods. But you don't even mention the names of their gods. You don't even speak them aloud. Right now you can hear it upon the mouths of the voices that surround us all the time. We can hear, read, see about the idol gods that people worship. And the church is instructed during this time of idol worship in our culture. Anything that is placed above God, anything that is placed there and in, in replaces God in somebody's life. It is an idol and their names are spoken aloud day after day. They build these idols to these gods. But the church, the church of God, the church of Jesus Christ is not to even mention the names of the gods of this world. One after one throughout history, those ancient gods suffered the very same fate as Dagon. They crumbled down, they fell, they shattered, and they faded away into history. Gods that could not see, could not hear, could not touch or smell or taste or speak. A skeptic looks at the history of all these religions and all these gods that have faded away over time. And he might ask, what makes the God of the Bible any different from the rest of these gods? What makes the God of your Bible any different than Dagon, any different than all these other gods that came and have gone? Gods were established. Gods were worshipped. Gods had idols crafted for them. And those gods have gone. Those gods have disappeared over time. And I probably would say there's not a lot of Dagon worshippers out there today. There's probably not a lot of Beelzebub worshipers out there today. But the question comes, what makes your faith worthwhile when all these other faiths have existed throughout time? During times of stress or anxiety, during times of war or disease, during times like this very current pandemic that we're experiencing right now, there's always somebody that's waiting, somebody that's hoping, somebody that is borderline begging to ask the question, where is your God now? Where is your God right now at this very moment? Where is He? Can you see Him? Do you hear His voice? Is He worth serving? The famous atheist Richard Dawkins was asked by a journalist. They, they asked, assume that there is a God and you were given the chance to ask Him one question. What would that question be in? Dawkins kind of paraphrased a quote that came before him and he said, I would ask, sir, why did you go to such lengths to hide yourself? But I would say that it's not because God is not there. It's because somebody will not open their eyes to the clear and present God that surrounds us this very day. In Romans 1 and 20 it says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. You can look around this world, you can even speak to another person, and even the processing of what they are saying, the hearing, the speaking, the understanding, the concepts that roll through us, even in these actions you can find the fingerprints of a living God. God is there if you will open your eyes to His presence. This last Wednesday, my wife Sherry and I were at home, and we had just put our boys to bed, and we have a little almost three-month-old infant right now, and she's very colicky, and we're, we're three for three with colic, but we're, we're getting through it. It's almost been a little bit of a distraction to all the stuff that is going on right now, but we're, we're sitting in the living room, and we're talking, and I knew that I just put the boys to bed, and sometimes when we put them to bed, they start fighting. One will kick the other, and then I'll hear a scream, and I'll have to run upstairs, and I'll have to kind of mediate the, the discourse there and make sure that I, I figure out what's happening levy some sort of judgment in that scenario. But this Wednesday night, we're, we're sitting in the living room and we're talking. And I hear this very faint sound. This, ah. And I, I stopped her and I said, did you hear that? And your first thought with a colicky baby present is, did that baby make the sound? But she was holding her in her arms, so we knew it wasn't the baby. And I said, I think I just heard River, our son. And I ran up the stairs and I go into the room and they're both already asleep. And then I hear this sound again a little bit closer. Ah. I thought, well, that's, that's, that's a little strange. And I thought maybe it was somebody screaming outside. So I ran back down and we're talking. We're looking outside together. And to the sound guys, uh, I know Wes is going to be mixing some of this. I apologize in advance for the sound that's about to come out of me. 
But something very close, something very loud, something that we had never heard before made a sound just outside of our front window that absolutely sent a chill up our spines. And this sound, if I was to try to mimic it, I probably can't get that close, but it was like... I thought, well, that's it's not a kid screaming outside because I've never heard a kid make that noise. I don't think that's a human being. I didn't know what was happening outside of our house, and so I'm trying to process this. And I, I hear it over and over again. Every single time, it doesn't get any better. It just seems to get a little bit more frightening because we can't figure it out. And then finally, I open the door, and something goes running off, and I didn't see it. And Sherry said, there it goes. And it, she said, all I saw was this animal, and there was a white stripe on it, and we were trying to figure this out, so I get on YouTube and I start searching animal noises that I thought might be likely culprits. And what we found is that this noise that we heard, this blood curdling noise, was a red fox. And I didn't know that they made any noise that's even close to that. I didn't know that a red fox made a sound that sounded like it escaped the pits of hell. I had no idea that a fox was capable of making that noise. As a matter of fact, years ago, there was a viral video that spread across the internet, and it was a song. It's probably a decade ago or so. And the song, the question that it asked was, what does the fox say? And then it makes all these random noises. Well, I can tell you now with absolute certainty what the fox says. It says sounds of murder and chaos that will absolutely leave you terrified in the middle of the night. But if we had shut our eyes... And if we had any understanding of what that noise was, if we'd shut our eyes and even tried to block the sound out, we would still hear it just outside of our door. That sound that went, the sound of a fox outside of our house. We didn't see it. We didn't know what it was, but we knew that something was there, something that impacted our environment. Maybe this would be a better example for you to understand what I'm saying, but If you were walking through the Black Hills of South Dakota and you came across Mount Rushmore and you'd never heard of Mount Rushmore before, you had never seen a picture of it, you didn't know the people that are depicted on it, you didn't have any idea of what Mount Rushmore was, let's imagine you never had any knowledge of it, but then you stumble across those hills and stumble across that mass. I've never been there in person, but I've seen plenty of pictures. And you see George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Theodore Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln. Imagine that you stumbled across it. There was nobody to tell you what it was. And you looked up and looked at the person beside you and said, can you believe that enough time has passed, enough random chance and random luck has passed, enough seismic activity has taken place to construct a mountain with four men's gigantic faces etched in the side of it, can you believe that luck, this just randomly happened? If I said that, it would sound absolutely ridiculous. It would sound crazy. You would think that I lost my mind because of course somebody went up there and they etched the faces of these presidents into the side of this mountain. However, why is it ridiculous to believe in a God whose handiwork is clearly seen not only in the glory of His creation, but in the lives of His redeemed. If they ask you the question, where is your God right now? Let me tell you where our God is found. We have 2,000 years of evidence built up to show that Jesus Christ, dead, buried, and resurrected, and living again even today, can do what nobody else can. He can take the guilty sinner and clean them as if they were new again. Not one sinner, not 100 sinners, not 100,000 sinners. This is not anecdotal evidence where you can say, well, sure, these people's lives were changed for the better. But millions of people lining up to say, look, my life is the handiwork of a God that is full of power, full of grace, full of love, and full of redeeming virtue. Here is my God. If you're unfamiliar with the Pentecostals of Osher City, if you're a guest, if you maybe have never stepped foot inside of this building when we've gathered together, first of all, let me say welcome. Thank you for joining in to this webcast. We are glad to have you. But let me tell you something about us. This room that I'm standing in right now, this room with these empty pews, is usually 
when we gather together on a Sunday, is filled with sinners. It is filled with sinners, all of us sitting in here. Sinners filled with the pride of life. We were addicted to every substance known to man. We were hopeless, we were depressed, we were suicidal, angry, distracted. We were void of peace, void of, of morality. We were sexually deviant. We had no future to speak of. We were blinded in our spirits. We were deaf in our understanding and we were mute in our authority. But there is a mountain of evidence that sits in these pure and will soon sit again in these pews represented by man after man and woman after woman living testimonies that proclaim in an age of, in, of uncertainty if you want to know where our God is it's right here he's right here he's in the lives of people who can testify along with me that God is good God is still here and his power is absolutely just as it ever was my God is the peace that I feel in the midst of the storm. My God is in the healing of my mind, my body, and my spirit. My God is in the assurance that no matter what I face, my God has prepared a place for me. Here is my God. My God is in my story. My God is in the moment where I say, Father, I give everything to you. I'm not holding on to the names of these gods that this world might serve. But Father, I'm only going to declare one name above every other name. The name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. No other God has lasted this long without interruption. There's a reason that he persists. There's a reason that his name is still worshipped across the world today by so many people. It's because he is real. The evidence is that he persists. This is a very strange time that we're living in right now. I've said that a few times already in this message. It's a strange time. People in our church have actually been diagnosed as having the coronavirus. Thankfully, all that I know of so far have recovered or in the process of recovery. People in our church have lost their jobs during this time. Many are worrying for their jobs at this very moment. This is a time of uncertainty and fear, and I get it, I get it. However, however, we have an assurance in Romans 8 and 35. It says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? But I like the way the NASB says it here in verse 37. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loves us if you are worried about the future here is your God if you are worried about your finances here is your God if you are worried about your health here is your God hand that worry to the miracle worker wherever here happens to be for you today and let God make his presence known because if you will invite him he will do exactly as his word says that he will do he can do anything here is my God my God is in repentance when I turn my heart away from this world and the things of this world my God is in the baptism of the name of Jesus when you are buried in water and every sin is washed away and my God is in the infilling of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in another language that you do not understand filled with his presence and set apart for his glory here is my God my God is here today. I can feel His presence in this very moment. My God is as real as He has ever been. And I glory in His work. I glory in His power. I glory in His justice. I glory in His assurance in this very moment. God, You are good and Your mercy endures forever. God, I love You. We've built up God's we used to build them as idols that we could see, idols that were sometimes mixed with animals, sometimes mixed with mythical attributes. Sometimes they would have a weapon in hand. Sometimes they would have a story that would kind of make an impression on you, but we built up gods that we could look at and identify as, as a god, but now the gods are a little bit more insidious than that. Now the gods are something 
that we aspire to, something that we compare ourselves to, something that causes worry or doubt or fear within us. Whatever these gods might be in your own life, identify them, but do not speak their name. Identify them, but do not give them that power in your life because here in this place, here in your home, here in this moment is our God that can do anything. I wrap up with these three stories, these three quick stories. On October the 30th, 1971, the Soviet Union at that time dropped what would become known as the Tsar Bomb, two miles above the remote coast in northern Russia. It was part of a weapons test. It was the largest man-made explosion that has ever been detonated, equivalent to 50 million tons of TNT. 50 million tons of TNT. The bomb was attached to a parachute to slow it down as it descended, just enough that the pilots could fly 28 miles away, which gave them a 50% 50 chance of survival. The experience terrified the pilot so much that as soon as he landed, he quit his position on the spot and said, I will never, ever fly for the military again. It exploded with a force that was so strong that the shockwave that resulted actually traveled around the earth three complete times before it finally dissipated away where they could not register, they could not detect it any longer. Three times around the entire earth the shockwave traveled. That is what man is capable of. That is why man is scared right now because we see the power that we think that we have. We see the power that governments have. We see the power that culture has over us. We see these things. We think how powerful is all of this. That's what man is capable of. In 1883, the Indonesian volcano Krakatoa exploded, and the explosion was so loud that they could hear it 3,100 miles away. Over 40 miles away, sailors' eardrums were ruptured from the sound that was produced. The shockwave from this explosion circled the earth four times in one direction and three times in the opposite direction. And it was detected at these various stations seven times as that shockwave kept traveling the earth over and over and over again. The explosion caused devastation across not just Indonesia, not just Southeast Asia, but all across the world. It actually affected the weather. The, The volcano that exploded decades before, still in Indonesia, caused a whole summer to be called, a whole year to be called the year without a summer, the year where the the temperature dropped across the earth and there was a red fog that was all across North America that actually affected the crops and ruined and caused famine across the entire earth. That is what the earth is capable of. Man is capable of something that can travel around the earth three times and cause devastation. The earth itself is capable of doing something that can travel around the earth four times and cause devastation. But what about God? Where is God in all of this? Where is your God? The power of man circles three times. The power of the earth circles four times. But where is God? And you could say that he's in the creation of the man. He's in the creation of this earth. And that would be true. However, however, that limits God when you think of him in that way. Because there's a verse that, that kind of sums up his power over any circumstance in just five Words, five words in the first chapter of the Bible in Genesis 1 and 16. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. He made the stars also. You can watch footage of the Tsar bomb online. You can see the devastation it caused. Even though it was high above the earth, you could see the mushroom cloud that extended up into the sky. You can see it. It's terrifying to look at, even to this very day. You can look at some of the, the footage of volcanoes around the earth, the ones that they're even scared of erupting today. And you might think that's powerful. That's something to be terrified of, something to be scared of. You can even hear about the volcano underneath Yellowstone and people talk about it today that if it ever happens, it's going to cause devastation across the entire earth. And we hear those stories and sometimes people get anxious about it. But within those five words, there's something about my God that you can read, something that you can, that you can find and find not only comfort, but wonder in. With those five words, 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe were formed. Each galaxy, each of those 200 billion galaxies holding an average of 100 billion stars in the universe to this day, right now, is still 
expanding. But for our God, the God that created heaven and earth, it was just five words, and he made the stars also. They were almost an afterthought. And we're impressed with ourselves when we can look at this devastation with the Tsar bomb and we can say, oh, look at how many times it traveled around the earth. Look at how many times these volcanoes travel around the earth. But then God does one thing. He speaks just a few words. And all of a sudden, an eternity of galaxies is formed and still to this day is expanding. And we just pass over that scripture like it's nothing because we're too consumed with the gods of this age and speaking their names out loud and giving them a power that they do not Deserve. He made the stars also. The God that holds them in place. Holds our days in the palm of his hand even right now. Here's our God. The God that can take this moment that others see as a time for fear. A time for worry and say no. Watch me turn everything from fear and doubt and worry into the revival that I promised unto you. And if you're worried right now, I pray that you would speak the name of God with the understanding that every God that we have built for ourselves on this earth cannot compare to the God that with five words, five words, he made the stars also. God's not worried about this. God's not fearful right now. God is not shaking in his boots right now. He's not worried about how the politicians deal with it necessarily. He's not worried about the fear that might come up because it's nothing to him. But if you've been speaking the names of these other gods, the economy, the recession, the possessions, the doubt, the anxiety, stop speaking their names. Stop speaking the names of the gods of this earth. I believe that God gave us this passage. If you would, put that on the screen for me from Jeremiah. I gave it to you all just a little bit before. I'm sorry, I didn't write it down in my notes. I want to speak it aloud. Jeremiah 10 and 12. I believe that God gave me this verse as I studied all the rest of this by accident almost. And I read this and I thought, that is for right now. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Next verse, please. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causes the vapors to ascend. From the ends of the earth he maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Next one, please. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are vanity. And the work of errors in the time of their visitation, they shall perish. The worries that you have given power to shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things. And Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. So right now in your home, speak the name of the God that still has authority, still has power, still has the anointing, the the creation in his very voice to control all of this in an instant and speak life into your home. Wherever you are right now, raise your hands and I want you to start lifting your voice and speak the name of Jesus and give him the authority to move in your home. If you've lost your job already, speak the name of Jesus and believe that he is going to provide. If you're worried about your job right now, speak the name of Jesus and let peace come into your home right now. If you're worried about the future, what all of this means, what I, could you just listen to me for a moment? If we believe the word of God, then we know that he has prepared a place for us, and nothing that happens down here can shake you, can pull you away, can separate you from the love of God. Don't give them power by speaking their name. Speak only that name above every other name, the name of Jesus. Pray with me if you would. Father, I'm done reading the news. I'm I'm done listening to the people talk about all the stuff that they're worried about. I kind of echo Brother Shannon who's been texting and calling here lately. He's tired of the negativity because we know a God that resides above all of this. We know a God who resides in heaven, who is looking down. He's prepared a place for us, Father. You are the one. You are the one that controls all of this. 
in the palm of your hand. So, Father, we give you that authority right now. We rebuke the enemy. We rebuke every name of every idol God that has tried to rise up in your place. And, Father, we give you the authority to move in our homes, in our hearts, in our futures right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, let it be done. God, I love you with my whole heart. And, Father, right now I'm preaching a message of trust in you. So, Father, help me to live that out right now. God, I want to trust in you. I want to believe in you. I want to believe in every word, every promise spoken. In the name of Jesus. God, you are good. God, you are good. Jesus, you are good. Somebody at home, lift your voice right now and say hallelujah. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Here is my God. He inhabits the praises of his people. So make his presence known by giving him the praise that he so rightfully deserves right now. Father, you are good. There's no one besides you. There is no one like you. There's nobody that ever compares to you, Father. No one besides you. No one can ascend to your throne. It is you and only you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Cover our homes. Cover our homes with the anointing of Jesus. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Music team, go ahead, and if you're at home, why don't you join them as they sing this. Nothing that's too hard for God. He's not afraid right now. Don't give the enemy power he does not have. Give God the praise that he deserves right now in your homes. Lift up your voices. Lift up your hearts.
Wow, thank you, Pastor Ryan, for bringing that word. And thank you, current students, for leading us in worship. Also, thank you to everyone that joined us this morning. It is so good to have you with us on our church online service. Just a quick reminder, we do have Brother Matt Tuttle bringing the word tonight at 6 o'clock, so you do not want to miss that. Again, thank you so much, and let's leave this service rejoicing.